This morning I would like to expand again upon the quote from Heavenly Places, page 354. There in paragraph 3, where the Spirit of Prophecy says, I want you to fall in love with the man of Calvary so that at every step you can say to the world, His ways are ways of pleasantness and all His paths are peace. Indeed, it is my burden that everyone who hears the words I proclaim will fall in love with Jesus. There was one who did fall in love with him. He's the one of our scripture reading. And here is expressed what someone does when they have fallen in love with somebody. They can't help but talk about that person. And that's what the Apostle Paul says. I don't come to you with oratory, with the wisdom that is engendered in those who are the public speakers. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You will recall from last week when I shared the, the falling in love with, with God, with Jesus, that when somebody falls in love with him, I quoted from Testimony, Volume 2, page 262, how our fondest thoughts, our warmest thoughts, our affections are all wrapped up with him. And this morning I want to quote from Our High Calling, page 338, paragraph 3, where this is sharpened in our appreciation. It says, If we believe in Jesus, we will love to think of Him. Love to talk of Him. Love to pray to Him. He is supreme in our affections. We love that which Christ loves. And we hate that which Christ hates. This is the mentality of those who are Christians, who are not merely professed Christians, it is those who really are totally sold on their Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they were called Christians in the first place. When the people at Antioch saw them, they could see that these people couldn't help but talk about Jesus. And that's why they called them Christians. That was the reason. When I meet Christians today, I marvel. What is a Christian today? Not like they used to be. In other words, on any subject that is being talked about, Jesus is the point of reference. When I touched on this many years ago in the ministry of the church I was uh, employed by there, when I, say, when I read, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified, a person exclaimed, 
that's weird, he said. There are so many subjects in the Bible that you can talk about. There are so many other things but only Jesus. And I thought, oh. And he was a professed reformer. And I thought, yeah, that's about the problem, isn't it? All the subjects, all the subjects that you can ever study in the Bible is dependent upon my relationship with Christ and must be centered as a point of reference in Him. And I'll read this here beautifully expressed. If you have your study Bible, it's on page 1132 under John. Um, it's Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1137, in paragraph 7. <coughs> and there... Uh, <coughs> it's a comment upon John chapter um, 12, it is. And reading there um, under the comment of... Um, of John chapter uh, 12, verse 32. And there it says, study all in the light from the cross, the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated and I pause there for a moment if you want to understand and appreciate any subject to rightly understand and appreciate it every truth in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light which streams from the cross of Calvary and in connection with the wondrous central truth of the Saviour's atonement. And so there it is. Jesus and his atonement must be the point of reference to any subject that you would study. And therefore it is my purpose this morning, during this hour, to crystallize our focus. Subjects versus the source of the subject. I want to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. So does that mean there are no subjects besides Jesus that are addressed here? It is focusing on Jesus, the source of any subject that Apostle Paul addresses here. There are many subjects, wonderful subjects, good subjects in themselves. Like for instance, I just want to run down a few of these subjects for us to consider how valuable they are. The subject of creation versus evolution. Isn't that an interesting subject? And people get entrenched in pursuing that subject then the subject of morality, where you get the philosophers dealing with morality. And of course the Bible is full of the subject of morality. Then the subject of history, historians. And of course as we look at history, we look at prophecy. Isn't that a tremendous subject to study? And people become fascinated and they enlarge their capability of understanding prophecy in its relation to history. Then another very lovely subject, what is truth? Truth versus fallacy. Making a real study of that. What's truth and what is fallacy? Fascinating, isn't it? Then we come to the interesting subject that affects many of us, 
the science of nutrition. You know, what does food do to your body? And the careful study into all that. Isn't that fascinating? Oh, I'm sick here and I need something for that and, and so on. The science of health. These are all very fascinating subjects. The subject of the sin problem. The origin of evil. Very fascinating. Or the, the study of world events of today. You know, with all these things that are happening in the world around us. How, how um, there is this spiritualistic influence in the world around us, in politics and so on. Aliens, where do they come from? All that study. Very interesting. Very fascinating. I want to read you a statement from uh, Adventist Home. Page 305. Adventist Home. Page 305. It says here in paragraph 2. Um, I think I have uh, misquoted, misdirected here the statement I am looking for. Uh, oh yes, it's right here in front of me. Sorry, I can't, can't, didn't put my finger on it. It says, Many in the world, it's in paragraph one in fact, Many in the world have their affection on things that may be good in themselves. But their minds are satisfied with these things and do not seek the greater and higher good that Christ desires to give them. Now we must not rudely seek to deprive them of what they hold dear. Reveal to them the beauty and preciousness of truth, lead them to behold Christ and his loveliness. Then they will turn aside from everything that will draw their affections away from him. This is a fascinating statement to meditate about. Because according to the inspiration here, there are many things that I can spend my affectionate mental exercises upon good in themselves. And I drew some of these good subjects. They're all good, even from the Bible. But while they are from the Bible, it is very possible that the affections are centered upon the topics instead of the loveliness of Jesus Christ. And therefore, if people are fascinated with certain subjects, we are told here, don't attack them for what they're fascinated with. Don't rudely tell them, what are you wasting your time doing that? Reveal to them the beauty and preciousness of Christ and his loveliness so that they will turn aside from everything that will draw their affections away from him. Now, this is a strange uh, mind activity, which I'm praying that God will help us now to really appreciate. All studies of that nature, of just looking at the subjects themselves, you know, people go to college, to do the ministerial training, and they study into all these subjects. And they really believe that they have become ministers of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, there is something missing. 
Jesus, just about right, in the spirit of prophecy, it says, there are many in the church who will make shipwreck because they have the truth, but they have it not as it is in Jesus. In other words, they do not have their affections in the beauty of Jesus. As Apostle Paul said, I want to know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. And then any other subject that is dealt with is dealt with as it is in Jesus. And that is what Apostle Paul wanted to get across to the people. And that's what I yearn to get across that we are so in love with Jesus that everything I look at is Jesus. Whatever it is. All those good subjects must be seen as it is in Jesus. Because all the studies of truth, whether it be truths of the Bible or science or whatever it is, all those studies in history, all those studies of that nature are colored by the notions and pride of man. You know, I know something. I have this knowledge of God, a theology, and how many ministers are wrapped up in the pride of opinion of their studies of theology. Pride of opinion. And the notions of human observation, the notions of human observation, you know, just a very crass one, <laughs> The amphibians, you know, how we have developed out of the amphibian, you know, these creatures from the sea. Uh, look at their scales and look at their, their fins. You see, you've got a little le left over there. There's a fin there. There used to be a fin there once. And also right there, too, there's a bit of a hump there. There's a, there used to be a fin once. And if you study carefully the follicles of your hair, it's exactly like the scales on the fish. They have three little promotions in those scales and you have three little hairs coming out of one follicle. That is an observation which is interpreted, which is a human notion that we have developed from fish. Fabrications of evolution. But you do this if you are not under Christ's love, you will do it with every subject. The notions, whether it be on health, whether it be on, on the events around us, we observe things and we come up with our own observations. And what are they? Mingled with human notions. I want to get it exact. I want to get it in its purity, in its perfection of truth. A very interesting observation, you know. Mother asks the child in a city, Darling, where does milk come from? And what does the baby, mother, what does the child say? Oh, I'm off the shelf of the shop. Because the child has not seen a cow being milked. So it comes off the shelf. The child is concluding by observation. That's what we do with God. When we study from our perspective. It's interesting that, quote, that uh, particular uh, in illustration I've just given. Mum asking the child. You can find in the Bible, God asks somebody some answers like that. Go to Job. Job 38, <coughs> verses 3 to 6. Here, God is doing exactly like the mother does to the child. 
that knows not the answers. Only God knows the true answers. Job 38, verses 3 through to 6. Fascinating question here. He speaks to Job. He says, Gird up now thy loins like a man. For I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? You know, that's what the mythology of, of the Romans and the Greeks have. They have a picture of earth with Atlas holding it up. <laughs> that's what they thought it was. The God of Atlas holding up the earth. And, Jesus, and God says here to Job, where's the foundation? What is holding the earth up? Do you know? Were you there when I laid it all? When I put it all into action? You see, do you know? You might study it out carefully and you might draw certain conclusions of your own notions, but do you really know? And then verse 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? You know, when God said in the beginning... Let there be light. Where did that come from? Etc. And indeed, Genesis 1 verse 1 says it so plainly, In the beginning, God. Where are you and I? What do we know? We study, we look at all the, the reasonings and studying, and we draw conclusions, and God says to Job, as he says to us, Where were you? What do you know? Do you have understanding? And at the very end, as he went right through all the different questions, poor Job, he was just overwhelmed. And I love Job, where God speaks like that. It really puts us all on our haunches. Ugh, sorry, I know you know everything. I don't know anything. Oh yes, we might pride ourselves to think we know something. But as it says in Corinthians, we know not yet as we ought to know. So don't be too high and mighty with what I know. Nothing. What I want to know is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I want to know a love that motivates my inward being. That's the thing I need to know. And so I want to read this point of the questions that God is posing, where only can correct answers to anything be found? Where only? It's a beautiful quote from the book Education. Education, chap uh, page uh, 134. <coughs> Education 134. And there we read in paragraph 2 onwards a very challenging reality as it is put. The question was put by God and now it is beautifully exposed here. It says, Genesis 1, 1 is quoted. In the beginning, God. Here alone can the mind in its eager questioning, fleeing as the dove to the ark, find rest. Above, beneath, beyond, abides infinite what? <laughs> abides infinite love working out all things to accomplish the good pleasure of his goodness. The invisible things of him since the creation of the world are perceived 
through the things that are made, even his everlasting power and divinity. Oh yes, we can get a perception by the things which he created. We can study his created thi- uh, creature, creations, but they can only be perceived. But their testimony can be understood only through the aid of the divine teacher. They can be understood correctly only through the aid of the divine teacher. What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. She's quoting all those beautiful texts. And now comes this powerful statement. Only, and I repeat, only by the aid of that spirit who in the beginning was brooding over the face of the waters, of that word by whom all things were made, of that true light which lighteth every man that comes into the world, can the testimony of science be rightly interpreted. (laughs) Isn't that beautiful? Only by their guidance can its deepest truths be discerned. Only under the direction of the omniscient one shall we, in the study of his works, be enabled to think his thoughts after him. What a privilege. We may know all things that God knows. We can think his thoughts after him. What a privilege. But how? And this is what I want to spend time with you here. What Apostle Paul said, I want to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. That is my focus. That is my intelligent engagement. And everything else comes from that. Nothing else. I don't go anywhere else but to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, who knows the infinite details and can show me like the apostles. When Jesus was there with them, is Jesus with us here? Amen. He is with us here. He was among the apostles and they held observational understandings from God's word itself as well. They held notions. And Jesus in his great love for them tried to guide them safely. Let's just spend a bit of time again as to how he tried to do that. But their notions got in the way. Have you ever listened to somebody who was trying to get something across to you and, and as you're trying to get, uh, get something across, the other person says, yeah, 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 it's this way. And you go, oh, that's not what I meant. But the person really believed that that's what you meant. Because the human factor is a notional factor. Notions. Be aware of this fact. The notions that the apostles had was that everything that was written about the Messiah was what? He was going to rule in the kingdom. Now, you know, you can interpret that because it's written that way, isn't it? He's, there are so many passages of Scripture that actually declare that Jesus is the king of kings and he's now on earth, he's the Messiah and he's going to be king, of course. Notions. Of course he's a king. But that he, under the notional interpretation, was going to be the king in Jerusalem and was going to free them from the Roman yoke was a notion. 
And they held that notion so strongly because they felt absolutely sure that that's what the Scripture said when Jesus told them in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to 23. Matthew chapter 16. They responded, uh-uh, <laughs> that's not right, Jesus. Listen to this. This is so fascinating. And read it carefully with me because you've probably read it before, but here is an interesting revelation. It says in verse 21 to 23 of Matthew 16, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now what did Peter do with his notion? You know, he stood there and thought, <laughs> I've got to correct Jesus here. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And what did Jesus have to turn around and do? But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Think carefully what is transcribed, tra transpiring here. In regards to the notional mentality of people who even study the word and come up with a notional conclusion, as did these men. Yes, Jesus was the king. In fact, when Pilate spoke to him, you know, he said, you know, uh, I am the king of my kingdom, etc. He talked about his kingdom and so on. And that's why the Pilate put on there the king of the Jews. Oh, they hated that. But the Pharisees, the disciples thought, yes. <gasps> and he's hanging on the cross. This, is this really the Messiah after all? We had hoped, remember, in on the road to Emmaus? We had hoped that he would be the one who would redeem us. The notion was so strong that even their love for Jesus was obliterated. If they really loved him, they would trust what he had to tell them, wouldn't he? How real is that for us today? And then we know so well how that Peter with his self-assurance was confronted by the words of Jesus once again and his notion was still so powerful there in Matthew 26, verse 31 through to, 20, to 35, 31 to 35, Then said Jesus unto them, this was straight after the Lord's Supper, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I shall smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with ye, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Why did they say it? He was their hero. Indeed, they loved him. But their notions of interpreting who he was spoiled their experience. And they were bitterly disappointed. How much longer do any of us fall into this danger 
that we in our love to the Lord hold on to notional conclusions. And as Sister White writes, as I quoted there, that there are many who will make shipwreck because they had the truth. It was true that Jesus was the Messiah. It was true that he was the king, but they had it not as it was in Jesus. And this is our same danger. And you remember how the love of Jesus helped Peter through. That he said, Lovest thou me, Peter? Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. In love, Jesus had won his heart so that now he can be a true representative of Jesus where his heart was so wrapped up with Jesus that all that he could do was to uplift him and have the truth as it is in him. And in his mercy to us, Jesus unveils to us by providence and by his counsel through his ministry, he exposes our utter dependence on his revealings instead of my own happy discoveries of my own interpretations and notions. He does that with us and the love of Jesus is here operating in our lives to try and bring us to this deep appreciation. You know, this principle is so fine-tuned that those people who are devout in every doctrine and teaching of the Bible applying their mind to the truths of the Bible while the love of Jesus is absent, these people are themselves lost. That's frightening. But let me read it here. In Testimony, Volume 1, Page 162, in paragraph 4, it says, and it's very interesting, subdue the carnal mind. What mind? My mind, my carnal mind, my mind that looks at everything from my own human notions like Peter, like the apostles, like Judas. Subdue the carnal mind, reform the life, and the poor mortal frame will not be idolized. If the heart is reformed, it will be seen in the outward appearance. If Christ be in us, the hope of glory, if Christ be in us, the hope of glory, we shall discover such matchless charms in him that the soul will be enamored. That, that's a good word, enamored. <laughs> I'm so charmed, I'm just, I'm just in love. I'm just, I'm just googling at, at it. It's just so wonderful, my my. Heart is enamored, my soul is enamored. It will cleave to him. It will choose to love him and in admiration of him, what will happen? In admiration of him, self will be forgotten. Jesus will be magnified and adored and self abased and humbled. But a profession without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, and heavy drudgery. 
many, now notice this word notion, many of you may retain a notion of religion in the head, on the outside, an outside religion, when the heart is not cleansed. God looks at the heart. All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Will he be satisfied with anything but the truth in the inward parts? Every truly converted soul will carry the unmistakable marks that the carnal mind is subdued. As you meditate on that statement, and I encourage you to go home and meditate on it deeply, it is such a shocking reality that my natural man is going to look at all these beautiful truths. We might have them all in place exactly where they should be. We might be defending original Adventism. But if it comes from my own common sense conclusions instead of a love in my Lord and Saviour in my inward parts, God can't have me. And that's again what is quoted, that we may have the truth, but we don't have it in Jesus. If you have your mind and affections set on gaining information, if we have our mind set on gaining information for the sake of discovering beautiful information and truth, how long will it take before you know as you should know? How long will it take? You're never going to get there. If you're going to rely upon studying the details simply from the perspective of knowing truth, when will you come to know truth in its entirety? Never. If your mind is upon him, if your affections is in, uh, upon him and you have him, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom all the truth of anything in the universe is encapsulated. Can you know, can you know instantly when knowledge is needed on a subject? Think about it. You have him. And he has, in him is encapsulated all truth. And if you have him, and as we were reading, if he is your teacher and your instructor, and you need knowledge at a particular given time, and you haven't got it, do you think you can have it instantly? Do you think you can? If he chooses to reveal it to you, don't you think you can? But if you haven't got him, and you're going, oh, wait a minute, I've got to go and study that one up. I've got to really work hard to get the truth on that one and I work through it and I might never come up with it satisfactorily. But Jesus knows exactly what the truth is. Let's let this point that I have just laid out before you, let's examine the word now and see how realistic this is. That if I have him, I know everything. If I don't have him, I don't know as I should know. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through to 10. And this is why this statement is uttered. Be careful, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Can you see what it's saying? 
This is the warning to believers. Don't let yourself be spoiled by the, the manner of man's way of getting into truth. Through philosophy, through vain deceit, indeed, Pride of opinion, vain deceit. I have worked this out and I can show you. <laughs> See what? I'm better than you. You can't get away from that if you have gained knowledge from that perspective. You will become a vain Christian. We are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's exactly the Laodicean condition. Don't let this happen. Beware. For, what does it say? After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of, of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. What are you? Complete in him. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So concentrate on him. Don't let philosophy and the wisdom of man and the knowledge of discovering information outside of, of looking to Jesus take you over. Beware. Because in him, Jesus, is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And if you are in him and he is in you, let's go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 17 to 19. And here is the appeal, the prayer of the prophet. In verse 14 he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in what? <laughs> I love it. In love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with what? All the fullness of the Godhead, of God. What's this privilege? We may know as God knows. Ooh, am I blaspheming? According to this, it takes us to 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. And here the Apostle John puts it very simply. He, he talks about those who were with us and have gone out from among us. They were not of us. And then he says, verse 20, But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know what? How much? Only a little bit? You know all things. Why? Because you have the Holy One inside of you. And you are so in love with Him. You embrace Him. He is everything to you. And you, in your own mind, know that I don't know anything. But you know everything, God, and I'm hanging on to you. You will show me in every given situation. I'm going to rely, I'm going to trust you for the truth on anything. And when you've got that, then you have an unction, the Holy Spirit. And that is beautifully, in 1 Corinthians 2, that is beautifully identified there. Because <laughs> this, this is misread most of the time. People say, yeah, we don't know yet. We're going to know one day. But look at this. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. And this is part of his very initial wording where he says, I know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Now he says in verse 9, 
As it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But, that word but is a clarifying statement. I don't know. But, God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And so he then ventures forward to describe that every man inside of himself knows what he's thinking inside of himself, and uh, you don't know, only he knows. And so it is with God, the Holy Spirit knows the deep things of God, now, verse 12, we have received not the spirit of the world. We haven't got the spirit of mentality of the way the world gets to information, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. The apostle goes out proclaiming this, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I want to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified, that which the Holy Ghost teaches. And of course, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. That was the case with Peter. No, Jesus, that's not right. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> wow. So here it is, now verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things or in the margin, it says, discerneth all things. <laughs> wow. He discerns all things. Why? Because he's got Jesus in him. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is discerned of no man, judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. All the fullness of the Godhead is there. Can you know all things? Of course you can, when God shows you. And when you need it, you know it. Because God will show you. But this is only possible if you have fallen in love with Jesus. Because unless I have fallen in love with Jesus, I will cling to my notions and my pride of opinion. You can't help it. You will. The love of Jesus is of a nature that, as we read before, takes away selfism. It's a humbling discovery, as Peter and the apostles discovered. And here I read it from God's Amazing Grace, page 105, paragraph 5. The true Christian, who? True Christian, will make God first and last in everything. No ambitious motives will chill his love for God. What happened with Peter? His love was chilled. He was actually trying to tell Jesus a thing or two. That's what it means to have your love chilled. No ambitious motives will chill his love for God. Steadily, perseveringly will he cause honor to redound to his heavenly father it is when we are faithful in exalting the name of God that our impulses are under divine supervision don't you like that supervise thank you Lord you be my supervisor you tell me what to do and what to know, and what to believe. And by that, as I read there, 
that the exalting the name of God, our impulses are under divine supervision, and we are enabled to develop spiritual and intellectual power. Now I want to conclude with a wonderful, wonderful example. This, is, this tickles my fancy. Children, listen carefully. If you love Jesus, what is possible to you that you don't know as much as mommy and daddy? But what is possible if you really love Jesus as he really is? What is possible? I read it from Great Controversy, page 366. In Scandinavia, the Advent message was proclaimed and a widespread interest was kindled. Many were roused from their careless security to confess and forsake their sins and seek pardon in the name of Christ. But the clergy of the state church opposed the movement and through their influence some who preached the message were thrown into prison. In many places where the preachers of the Lord's soon coming were thus silenced, God was pleased to send the message in a miraculous manner through little children. As they were under age, the law of the state could not restrain them and they were permitted to speak unmolested. The movement was chiefly among the lower class, and it was in the humble dwellings of the laborers that the people assembled to hear the warning. They came to listen to children preaching. The child preachers, now notice this, the child preachers themselves were mostly poor cottagers. Did they have a degree? <laughs> Did they have a knowledge of much? Poor peasant children. Some of them, some of them were not more than six or eight years of age. And while, and listen carefully here, while their lives testified that they loved the Savior and were trying to live in obedience to God's holy requirements, what were they wrapped up with? They loved their Savior, and they wanted to obey God's holy requirements. They ordinarily manifested only the intelligence and ability usually seen in children of that age. When standing before the people, however, it was evident that they were moved by an influence beyond their own natural gifts. Tone and manner changed. With solemn power, they gave the warning of the judgment, employing the very words of Scripture. Who gave them that? They quoted, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. They reproved the sins of the people, not only condemning immorality and vice, but rebuking worldliness and backsliding and warning their hearers to make haste to flee from the wrath to come. The people heard with trembling the convicting Spirit of God spoke to their hearts. Many were led to search the Scriptures with new and deeper interests that intemperate and immoral were reformed, others abandoned their dishonest practices, and a work was done so marked that even ministers of the state church were forced to acknowledge that the hand of God was in the movement. This was the Adventist movement. Tell me, did those children know everything? They did. Not because they knew it from their own background. Jesus was in them. And if Jesus is in you and me, 
those things that I don't know at this moment, I will know when I need it. Because Jesus knows everything and he will show us. Are you ever afraid of having to stand in the courts one day and you think, oh, I don't know all the answers. Oh dear, I'm not going to be able to stand. Well, if you really love Jesus, perfect love casteth out all fear. Isn't that a statement from the Bible? And that love and trust in him will be all your objective entirely. And when you stand in the courts and you have loved everything that the Lord has shown you in the past as adults, he, Jesus promised, when you stand before the people, you are not to think, what am I going to answer? Because it will be given you as to what you should answer. If you have Jesus, you have it. And there I go back to that beautiful experience I made with that alcoholic who had brain damage. He loved Jesus. And when he was tested by the psychiatrist of the hospital, he gave answers that shocked that man. And when they tested his brain recovery, it was 100% recovered. There was no brain damage from severe alcoholism which he had before. Jesus. Do you love him? There is nothing impossible. The knowledge that we need is found in our love for Jesus, not our love for facts, our love for discovering information. It's our love for Jesus. And when we have him, we have everything, even eternal life. Praise the Lord. May he be with us in this understanding as our love for him gets stronger and more beautiful. Amen. Father in heaven, we joyfully kneel before you. We know nothing as we ought to know it from our own background of careful study. We know nothing and we want to now know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. We thank you that in Jesus it does not mean that we should not study. But we know that when you are with us and in our hearts, then everything we study will be discerned correctly. Help us, Lord, to not become in any way careless. For when we love you with all our hearts, we are diligent. And so you have told us, only he who seeks you with all his heart, you will be found of him. And so, Father, as we take these realities that we have here researched in your beautiful word, and as we have beheld your wonderful love in dealing with sinners such as I, that you have laid out into our comfort this appreciation that you are the one who will guide us safely into all truth. And when we need it most, it's there. And yes, indeed, like those children, Father, even the most learned men could see that this was you. So help us to be like those children. Help us to be courteous, respectful to authority in our own hearts. Help us to, to behold your wonderful, wonderful love so completely that self indeed and all the notions of human pride will be chilled and brought into nothing so that our love for you will continue to go warmer and hotter so that you do not have to spew us out of your mouth. 
thank you for this, Father. Go with each one of us that we will make this our focal point of embracing Jesus and loving him and opening our hearts wide to all your loving kindness. We thank you for this. We commit ourselves into your holy hands. In Jesus' precious name, amen.